So we're very pleased today to have uh, Matias Aldariaga. Uh, Matias got his PhD at MIT. He then had a long and uh, uh, illustrious career, including a period of time where he was here, and then he went back north, and now he's down at the Institute for Advanced Study, and he studies many things, but today he's going to talk to us about gravitational wave astrophysics. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks very much for the invitation and the opportunity to come back um, to NYU and see a bunch of people from time even when I was here, so it's great. Um, so, um, you know, I usually was uh, working mainly on cosmology, but in the last few years I've uh, ventured into gravitational waves and analysis of the LIGO Virgo data. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, uh, first, I will start by, uh, see. So these are the people uh, who I've been working with. Um, it started with a bunch of people which at the time were postdocs at the IAS, Barak, Teja, Liang, uh, and uh, some students at Princeton and other, other postdocs at the IAS. Now they're mostly moved on for the most part and there's already students like Jonathan who is a student of Barak at Princeton. So, uh, I still put GW at IS, but that's it's really a Zoom. It's not a GW at Zoom. It's not. Um, great. So these are the people I've been working with, and the outline of the talk. I'll first give you some sort of introduction to um, very fast, in case there's somebody who wants to hear a little bit about the, the status of LIGO, um, and I'll then uh, mention some few astrophysics questions related to the LIGO sources that uh, I've been interested in and we've uh, focused some of the, uh, our efforts on. Um, th there, won't be, um, there won't be definitive answers. The LIGO has, you know, on the order of 100, uh, 100 uh, sources that they have detected and uh, we're still trying to sort out the origin. So, but there are some puzzles and interesting things, so I'll just point to two of them. And then I'll talk about um, um, some of the specific things that we have been doing. Then these, for the most part, are results that are all based on LIGO. And most of these, uh, so it's just the LIGO team and then other people outside the LIGO team that are working on it. But so I, I will then try to focus on some of the things. Uh, I mean, along the way here, I chose this because of the things that we looked a little bit about. But uh, we've also been doing just plain data analysis or um, So gravitational waves, of course, comes in many frequencies from the CMB, which was something that I, or I am quite interested in, but now I went all the way to uh, the other end of the frequency range of the gravitational waves that people are trying to um, uh, detect and uh, sources to measure. And uh, so I'll be talking about this. Uh, the sources are then uh, compact objects uh, orbiting one another. Uh, binary black holes for the most part, a couple of binary neutron stars, and maybe some binary uh, neutron star black hole systems. So just to have everybody kind of in the same page, the LIGO sources are binaries then. For the most part, uh, we think, or the ones that we have seen are uh, um, uh, orbiting in a almost a circular orbit, or uh, basically circular orbit. So there's two masses then, M1 and M2. There's a total mass, some reduced mass, and some chirp mass. The chirp mass is important in the context of gravitational waves because it sets the time dependence of the frequency that you observe this gravitational wave. Um, so basically it's uh, T0 here is the time of the merger and the frequency increases in this what people call a chirp as you get close to the merger in some sort of power law with time, with the difference in time to the merger time. Um, and um, the strain of the gravitational waves that you observe, of course, they are in the detector, they are inversely proportional to how far away the distance d, how far away the thing is. And in terms of the dependence on the other parameters, it, the, the strain is larger, the larger the mass of the source, and uh, it, um, it also depends on the frequency that you're observing at. And uh, it has some phase that it was as a function of frequency. In the low, these formulas are. Um, at the lowest order in the PN expansion. So these are just some analytical formulas for the in spiral phase, the 
lowest possible order you can find a formula for. And uh, this in that limit uh, phase evolves with frequency also in this very simple way. So the main parameter during the inspired is this shear of mass. Um, now, the, so the, um, the system uh, emits gravitational waves, loses energy, shrinks the orbit, shrinks until eventually the two black holes, let's say in this, let's say it's that example, they collide and they form a single final black hole. There's a maximum frequency uh, of this emission of gravitational waves that you see, which is basically set by the mass of the final black hole, um, of the total mass of the system, and this is kind of the scale. So, um, um, right. So, uh, good. so just if you go look, this is from the very first, uh, uh, okay, so um, maybe. Um, yeah, we can do the lights. No, no, that's okay, it's the only one. But right. um, the, what, what I wanted to say is that um, um, if you ask the question of how, so the, the LIGO detectors uh, can measure frequencies from say from 20 hertz to a kilohertz. And so if you, if you look at this and ask the question for how long uh, the, the emission of this binary system is in the LIGO band, the, the lighter the system is, the longer the amount of time that you will see emission in the LIGO band. So that just from this simple power law there. So um, just so that we see, uh, these are some examples of uh, all, these are the oldest example, but this, uh, uh, some old examples, but um, so you can see here frequency and time and the colors on the back is the amount of energy or power in the signal seen by LIGO. So here you can see, this is the binary neutron star. You see nicely that chip formula. Um, and I just wanted to uh, point this out to uh, show you that uh, the range of uh, times that the signal is in the detector varies a lot. For the low mass, it takes a, the binary neutron star was in the LIGO band for a long time. Like this is 40 seconds over here. The heavy black holes for which most of the signals that LIGO is seeing, as you can see, I don't know, if we take this one, most of the power is in 0.1 or 0.2 seconds. Okay, that's just from the simple formula that I showed you before. But so there's a big range, and and you can see some of them. Th these uh, axes are always the same, 0.4 seconds. So some of them are longer, some of them are a little bit shorter. There, um, and you know these are only a few examples. But uh, okay, so that's that's uh, how the signal looks like. LIGO, uh, as you all know, went through some. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know, improvement that made it advanced LIGO from actual LIGO. Uh, the first detection when this turned on, uh, so this increased the volume up to which they could see sources by quite a bit, and it has kept on increasing as they, uh, so they, they do some observing run, they stop, they improve the things, they do another observing run, they stop, they improve the thing, they make another observing run, and now we are here between 03 and 04. There's, of course, some little delay here due to COVID or whatever the other reason. So we're waiting at the end in, in the next year to go to 04. So we are somewhere here. But you can see here, as a function of time, the number of uh, detections, uh, systems detected by LIGO. And you can see the change in slope. This is the cumulative number. And you can see this change in, in slope from 02 to 03. It's just their sensitivity getting better. Mm -hmm. So they see to a a larger volume and so in the same amount of time you get more okay so that's where we stand and you can see why um why it it helps them to why 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 they stop observing and fix and try to improve the detector rather than just uh, continue to observe because this improvement has uh, you know makes a big what exactly did they improve they change one of the mirrors, uh, they change the laser power in one of them, uh, one of the two, uh, one of the two, from so 02 to 03, that's what they did. Um, yeah, um, so at high frequency, it was mainly the, 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 the laser power was increased, so the short noise came down. Um, and then I think there was some improvement at low frequency. So it's some technology I will yeah, yeah. understand. Well, I think if we sit down now, I forgot because this is old, but yeah, you will understand. It's not so good. So good. I mean, it depends how deep you want to go. <laughs> uh, probably. 
uh, but yeah, they, they are changing uh, both the, the laser uh, and uh, yeah, optics, things like that. Um, okay, uh, good. So this is where, uh, the, where we are at in terms of the, or where they are at in terms of the observations. Uh, what are the things that people are trying to use these gravitational wave sources to learn about? Uh, properties of black holes and neutron stars, some uh, people that are more uh, ambitious want to test the laws of gravity in some regime where presumably we haven't tested them before, or even the speed of propagation of uh, gravitational waves relative to photons by looking at the, the, <clears throat> the, the optical and and gravitational waves from the binary neutron star. So these are the more, let's say, fundamental physics um, questions that you might uh, try to ask and answer. Um, but uh, for the most part, what we are trying to understand is how the process by which the black holes and the binary systems of these black holes form astrophysically. Uh, we are beginning to have a you know, some hundred sources, so you can start to make claims about the populations. So this is where we are at in terms of that. Uh, We're trying to make claims about the population with a hundred things. It's not uh, super uh, precise. Furthermore, these hundred things come in a wide range of masses and different properties. So by the time you look at the most interesting things that are going on, you only have one or two. And so the situation is uh, not uh, definitive, and, but I think uh, it's kind of fun in the sense that there are, you know, obvious questions that you can ask about how these things came about that we will discuss in a little bit. You can kind of uh, get some vague answer and debate about the answer yet because there's not enough data and you also know that the next time hopefully this curve will be even steeper and it will also be a year of and you will double or triple the data and it's very neat. So it's kind of a fun time in this respect. When does Lisa turn off? Oh. <laughs> you know, Most optimistic scenario? I don't know. But it's another type of sources though, right? Yeah. But I mean, we'll also get these at signal to noise infinity. Um, some of them, yes. Yeah, some of them, yes. Um, some of them, yes. Um, Could they seem like Einstein telescope? Um, but this is again um, future. I'm not in the business of the future. I'm already old. What's the <laughs> <laughs> this is there. It's happening. In the next so year. you're saying Lisa after you're dead? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way things are going. <laughs> you know, in many respects. <laughs> you're aware we're recording this, right? <laughs> I don't get in trouble. With something like I don't think you say anything as bad as anything I said recently. Uh, well, I don't know. <laughs> okay, yes, um, good. So uh, the other thing that uh, when you're playing these games of trying uh, to learn about the population of things, the other thing that you have to keep on the back of your mind is that how far away the volume up to which we can see these systems very much depends on the parameters, right? So. Intrinsically, probably there are many more mergers of neutron stars than these heavy black holes, and but LIGO sees only, for the most part, these heavy black holes because they can see them much further. So these are plots of, as a function of chirp mass, the volume up to up to which you can see some source, and you can see there's like uh, two or three orders of magnitude in these uh, in these uh, axes. The main thing then is the mass, but then. These are also curves for different values of the mass ratio or the spin, uh, some component of the spin that I will discuss a little bit. There's, again, maybe an order of magnitude here, or even if you go very extreme more. So not only you have few sources, but if you want to extrapolate the population, there are huge selection effects going around. Okay, so that's the caveat. So um, maybe if what you should walk away would be uh, kind of interesting, only a hundred sources, too much uncertainty, we will know more later, but then you can hear about some of the puzzles. Okay. By the way, that in astronomy, that is called the Momquist mom bias. bias. That's a on really good example. Kind of yeah. Yes. Um, sounds good. Okay, so um, there are many events. So these are, this is just from one of the LIGO papers, uh, one of these catalogs just half of the events in 03 just to put something and uh to mention so so um 
you so it's a pictorially to get uh, a few things that um, um, there are a lot of events, but the measurements of many of these parameters, like the mass ratio, are not particularly very good in many cases. So that's another thing to throw into the mix, right? Um, so in part, these are kind of the best measured parameters. The distance maybe is not particularly interesting. I don't know. But uh, so the, the, the two masses, uh, the mass ratio is the same. I mean, it doesn't add anything, but you can more or less get the two masses or maybe the one mass and a mass ratio not too well determined. And this is a component of the spin is the comp average component of the spin in the direction of the angular momentum. That which is, is spin, which the spin which of column, the black hole. Which column is this one? Chi effect, dude. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, so... Um, this, oh, sorry, sorry, Matthias. Yeah. Last time Levin told us that Kerr is not getting a Nobel Prize because Kerr metric has not been confirmed. Um, and yet you are measuring... I, I assume these guy is also dead, or no? No. He's <laughs> <laughs> he's still alive. Alive? no. no. I, I think so, oh, because, because in the previous talk, Levin was telling us <laughs> that only when we have uh, uh, be very eccentric... Okay, awesome. uh -huh. But at any rate, yeah. so <laughs> you are measuring, in fact, spin <laughs> to a sufficient accuracy, which means that Kerr metric, in some sense, has been confirmed directly. Well, okay. First of all... Uh, Otherwise, what do you call spin? Okay, what I call spin is uh, what I call spin in this particular case observationally is some sort of relation relationship between the max. It, it makes it changes the maximum frequency of the uh, 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 and the duration of the signal. So uh, at the very end of the inspira, you can think of this spin as. Uh, uh, the spin orbit coupling is providing a little bit of a repulsive force, so it takes a little bit longer to um, to merge. That's some heuristical way of saying it, but if you turn on an obvious yeah. component of the spin, it will take a little bit longer to merge or not. So you accumulate a little bit more cycles before you merge. But you would That's agree the that we have confirmed curve. No, metric. I would not say confirmed curve. At the very, edge, at the very most, I would say that in this event, the phase accumulation of the phase is not consistent with just no, you know, it's a little bit more. There could be other reasons, right? There could be other reasons. Okay. Oh, but there's, there's more data from accretion disk physics, right, on the spin of black holes. We have we have a lot of information on Yeah, yeah, it sounds just so ridiculous to me, but Levin is Levin, so I want no, to ask another one. He is 88, but he lives in New Zealand, so probably he's healthy. Kerr is alive. Kerr is alive. Sorry. Yeah, and Levin is also alive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one amazing thing about these is what a large fraction are consistent with Q of 1. Yes, this is not... Uh, I mean, yeah. obviously it's not very precise. But it is surprising. Well, it's a lot harder. To, I mean, in his yes. previous plot, yes. it's a lot harder to see yes. the lower, exactly. the lower Q. Uh, so very low Q. Oops, uh, I don't know yeah. what the direction I'm going here, but uh, low Q. Yes, I so, see. Yeah. And then, so that all second of all, um, once the templates are below Q of uh, I don't know point one or something like that, you can you could be Correct to be a little bit suspicious about their how accurate they are. So, but um, um, and and also you you also have to realize that because this is built in into the parameter estimation, when you don't, this is kind of a prior, right? Yeah. And so the moment you don't have a very good measurement, it will it tell you who is what. Yeah. So even even that's even though that's the case. I don't know if it ended up in this list, but there is a, a, a guy with, okay, it's not in this one, but. Uh, yes, one uh, of the weird things about guy. these plots for, for physicists is that these plots, I believe, are Bayesian posteriors, yes, 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 and okay. physicists are more used to looking at likelihood contours. Yes. And, and uh, so. some of these things, so in the best, when there's a and everything matters, is nice. And the Q axis, it matters whether yeah. you're- Here it matters, uh, and here it actually a little bit matters as well. Yeah. Here is where it matters the most, yeah. here it matters a little bit yeah. less. Yeah. And, and, and uh, related to that is, if you just kind of collapse those, that's not a good thing to do if those are posteriors. Uh, it's, anyway, there's yes. a statistics um, issue there. So 
Exactly. So all of these things make it uh, very treacher treacherous to say very much, but okay, let me just go ahead and say something. Um, so, okay, so let me talk about, uh, point out two things. I will talk about the spin. The second uh, topic is the spin. The other one is the masses. I mean, uh, uh, in this plot, this just uh, orga the organization in the x-axis of the different systems is random, but so there, for each LIGO event, there's two black holes that merge into another one, and they're just plotting the mass of the, this is just for, for public or whatever. And uh, so there's also masses estimated from, uh, in, in binaries, uh, from their electromagnetic emission and uh, um, neutron stars that are known, and here are neutron stars in the LIGO band, but the, the, um, the measured in, as LIGO events. Uh, but um, there's a lot of these guys that are, kind, I mean, the, of course, the final black hole is very heavy, but even the, um, the progenitor two black holes that are merging t tend to be quite much heavier than the typical black hole that, uh, that uh, we had uh, seen before. So. That's one thing that has happened, at least from the very beginning. That plot would be way more interesting if it was organized by time, time of discovery, yeah, uh, because yeah. we should see effects with time because the detectors are getting more sensitive. Um, yes, yes. Um, yeah, this uh, this is not. Uh, this is a This is too nice for me to be able. This is arranged by an artist. I can just Google contact. this and paste it here. That's kind of kind of. But. Um, Okay, but interestingly, if uh, the people that try to estimate, so let's see some of these plots. So people that try to estimate what is the mass uh, of uh, the final black, if you, if you think of uh, evolution of stars and you start with a, 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 a star and then a, when it starts in the main sequence, it has a given mass and you try to estimate the, the, the mass of the core at the center, which will eventually become a black hole as a function of this initial mass. People have calculations of this that depend on metallicities and various things. But one thing that they uh, that they claim is that past uh, somewhere around, uh, so regardless of the initial mass, past uh, you, you cannot form black holes heavier than around forty something solar masses between forty and fifty because. Um, when the star that the, at, at this kind of masses, there's an instability in this in this in, in this star related to production of pairs called pair pulsation and instability that blows up the star and doesn't end up with a black hole uh, uh, anymore. Um, and uh, okay, so that uh, is part of the standard our standard understanding of uh, the masses of potential black holes. So people thought. And uh, at the beginning of the LIGO, um, for the first two observing runs, this seemed to be a good uh, prediction that there wouldn't be any black holes heavier than some 45 or something like this. And in this paper, if you go there, you can see what happens. If, what, I don't remember which of all these plots I bring here, but changing all potential parameters of the star, the metallicity, and various uh, subgrid things, and blah, 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 this doesn't move very much. Okay, so. Um, but now, unfortunately, there are indeed some LIGO events that are very heavy. So this is the, the, the example that is the most uh, notorious, uh, 1905-21. First, uh, so this is from the LIGO paper. You can see the waveform. First thing you can see is that the waveform doesn't last. You know, it's just a few cycles in the LIGO band. This just means that it's so heavy that the, the maximum frequency is... Uh, it's just very low, and so it only goes from, say, 20 hertz to, I don't remember, but somewhere around 100 hertz or something like that. That's it. Um, and uh, so that's what, you know, by eye is telling you this is a very heavy thing, right? It's just like a few cycles in the LIGO band. Um, the second, and so this, we know that the, at least the sum of the total masses is, uh, the total mass is very high, right? And then you try to fit parameters, and you end up with, uh, so the whole thing is very heavy for, for sure. But then the question is, do the two, so in terms of uh, these uh, gaps, uh, this forbidden region for the black hole, once it becomes too heavy, you could form it again. So there's a possibility. So one question that you might try to ask, is this 
basically if you split the mass equally with q around one you will have two black holes in the middle of this band where you're supposed to not be able to have black holes that's the total mass that you see here and that's where it that where it, where it lands uh now the question is could it be that one is the mass ratio is high and, or, or low depending on your definition but very different masses so one is much heavier than this 130 and the other one falls below this line and that's uh, so this is from a paper that we wrote there are these two solutions now so people can debate um which one is true or not true uh, this is plots of the posterior of the two masses but the basic problem of this uh, in this event is that you can see that there are like as i was mentioning it's very short very few cycles these fits of uh, the gw systems have 15 parameters so obviously you can get many things out of this because it's just a few cycles. So and those that you're showing like you're, the contours there are some posterior, posterior. but then you also have various like other assumptions. These are posteriors that have been marginalized over all of the other. So what are the parameters? The parameters are the two masses, which are the two things shown here, but there are six spins. Okay, and then there are distance, orientation of the, you know, inclination, orientation of the sky, array and deck, time. So, so what's the red and the blue? Oh, the red and the blue. These are uh, to um, to uh, David's comment. Uh, different priors of the spin. So this depends also on that because there's degeneracies <laughs> and the other parameters involving the spin. Of course, this is like five. I don't know five ups and downs. So. I think at the moment we don't know the details of the two masses. I mean, you can people will probably debate one way or the other. But um, for for so it will get better in the future. Why? Because there will be more events. If they are like this, they will all be um, they will all have this problem. But hopefully, with a little bit more signal to noise, you will do better. But also, especially if LIGO can improve the low frequency part of the signal to noise if instead of 20 hertz you go to 10 hertz that's another factor of two in the frequency that's a lot and that will you know help Im immensely or if virgo which is the third detector um um you know it barely sees anything if you if you if you i mean there what's plotted here is basically the prediction from the other two on top of there and you can see something but um that breaks a lot of the degeneracies with the inclination. So as, as the third detector becomes better, that also. So more events uh, will, will definitely help, but it's, def but, it, but it's for sure the case that there are very heavy things, right? The details, maybe, maybe there's some hope that, uh, that this is a um, large mass ratio example, or otherwise, maybe this is a secondary black hole that was the, the result of the merger of two previous ones. This has some implications of, about the location where these mergers can happen, because if they happen in any place where the gravitational potential is not very large, the kick that uh, after the merger of the binary will make this black hole go away and not be able to merge with the, the other one. So um, I don't know. It's a it's a place to that will. I'm pretty sure that the next uh, the next observing run we will have uh, quite a few interesting more things to see. How much lower in frequency because it's seismic noise which can produce. yeah it's seismic noise so probably a factor of two is uh, reasonable but i don't know if we, uh, to be that is a part of the noise that in fact if you read the LIGO papers um it's above so if you look at the high frequency they have a per nice model depending on you know the short <laughs> noise of the laser this and that and the noise that they measure it matches what they predict on low frequency it's not the case. They have, I, I don't, I, I don't want to say an order of magnitude, but quite some of this order, more noise, they call it technical noise, so more than they, than they think they should have. And they, so that's a room for improvement. So I don't know what's the situation. So, okay. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to discuss uh, is the measurements of the spin. And to put it into context, I wanted to say the following. It's not particularly obvious how you got to these uh, binary black holes that merge uh, in LIGO band. Uh, because if you have two, two of these black holes, if, if they need to 
be uh, losing energy meaningfully by gravitational radiation to merge, say, in the age of the universe or something like that. They need to be very close together, like tens of solar radii. And these massive stars uh, during their giant phase are much bigger than that, right? So those things were very big, but now the two black holes are very close to one another. How did the, how did the, the two black holes that come from two stars, which were much, much bigger than this separation, uh, came to be so close to each other. And here there are various uh, different uh, scenarios of how this can happen. And we don't know exactly what's the dominant scenario. Everybody probably has their own. Uh, and, and maybe more than one of these scenarios is happening. Also, the mass range of the LIGO sees is very big, perhaps in one end is one thing, <coughs> the other end is some other thing. I don't know. But the typical scenario is some binary system. Uh, in which you have the two stars and then eventually say one of them becomes a black hole and then when the other one becomes a giant it engulfs this black hole and by the friction of this black hole with the envelope makes it sink closer to the other star and this energy ejects the envelope uh, and you end up with uh, the uh, wolf Rayet star and uh, and the first black hole very close to together. That would be some sort, I will call it the classic scenario of binary evolution. I don't know. But also in this scenario, the mass of this black hole, how much it grows, does it help? Is it a problem? That um, not to, for this very heavy, you mean accretion here? No, 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 no. nothing, not very much. I mean, not, not, not meaningful. So, um, well, you can see, you can see here how much it went from 35.1 to 36.5 or something. So it's not like that. But the separation does change the accretion, right? The final separation. Right. Well, okay. For the calculation of the final separation is like uh, okay, no. yeah. okay. I mean, I don't know. It's like some prescription. I mean, of equating the binding energy to these to the. Well, but uh, yes, uh, you can. I'm sure it will depend, but it's not that we know how to compute either way very precisely. Can have order of magnitude. The order of magnitude, I think, is fine. You will end up uh, if you ask the question at what separation, more or less, the gravitational, this gravitational binding energy is similar to the binding, uh, the M binding energy of this envelope. You end up in a separation that is reasonable. But why didn't it go all the way? Uh, you know, all of these are questions that are not, as far as I can tell, are not. Something is going into this population synthesis codes, but it's like a galaxy formation. <laughs> oh, this is being recorded. So. <laughs> okay, other situations. Nobody's coming out of this on skin. <laughs> yeah. um, other situations are some sort of. Uh, this is like uh, probably out there, and I mean, we see a lot of evidence of this. Uh, kind of thing, but it's a messy story. And so a lot of the people that like the dynamics, they usually go into work on this other kind of scenario in which you have some dense system, like a global cluster of the, or some uh, region around the galactic center where there's a lot of stars and then they already can, or and, and some of them have become black holes and they can interact and you have triple body interactions and you end up capturing one and expelling the other one and doing all of these nice dynamics. So all of, a lot of people like this, and there's a, I mean, it's nice. Uh, that's the, <laughs> I mean, it's also some calculation that at the end of the day, maybe it's not nature, but it, what you got was you could compute from the very beginning, right? And it's some answer. Uh, here it's like some tweaking. So uh, anyway, so there's that. And in some situ some situations, even uh, you can end up with uh, situations in which the the binary starts quite eccentric, very interesting, you know, chaotic three body things going on. So these are like the two channels, and you can try to use the rates, the masses, the spins, the eccentricities potentially. No eccentricity has been measured with that. Um, to try to distinguish between these two channels. This is kind of a zero order goal at the moment. And one, uh, one uh, thing that is possible is to use, is perhaps possible to use the spin, which starts to be measured now. And let me tell you a little bit about that. But uh, sorry, Matthias, do yeah. you expect any eccentricity if you start from a separation which brings them together in a Hubble time? Wouldn't you kill any eccentricity? Yes, yes. The eccentricity is the thing that dies the first. But in this, this is from uh, this paper. Uh, you can go look. I mean, again, uh, 
in very extreme situations of this three body when you you are captured already in the LIGO band almost so in so very eccentric and uh, and already when you are close to the so exotic okay yeah I mean not too exotic but uh, I mean if you go read these papers he will not try to explain a hundred percent of the LIGO rate but there will be some that he will explain again quite so. um, uh okay um so the classic scenario okay the binaries there are some examples of course in the you know, on galaxy x-ray binaries that we can um, we can get some insight from um so the, what what about so what 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 about the spins so what why might the spin be able to tell you about um the these two scenarios in one scenario then it's a system that's evolving you know, through all its life, the black holes and, and so on, the orbital angular, mom the direction of the angular momentum is there all the time. And so um, there are tides, there are um, uh, accretion. And so you end up with a preferential direction for the spin of the black holes aligned with the orbit of the angular momentum. However, if you start with two black holes that form in their own star somewhere, and then they come in this chaotic thing and they form a binary in their two directions of the spins of the black holes will be random. So that's, so that's a pretty uh, clear um, distinction. So if uh, black holes are born spinning and they just find each other, probably they will have random orientations. If, however, they form in this binary system, there's a chance that there's the preferred direction and you can see. And when you say aligned with the angular momentum, you mean aligned with the total angular momentum or with the spin angular momentum? The, or the orbit angular momentum? Orbital angular momentum. And the, in those situations, there would be only a very, let's say, very small misalignment. So the total angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum would be aligned. They're close. This is not 100% true because, for example, when the supernovae, when one of the supernovae explodes a kick, and so there's a little bit of a misalignment. But yeah. that's not a big deal. Suppose I mean you can work it. So um, um, so, um, but the other thing that is interesting is that uh, if you if you go um, if you go to this kind of uh, scenario and you look here at the at the stage before the second black hole uh, forms and you try to ask the question: Is there enough time for there to be a tidal locking between uh, these two things uh, in given how close they are, because they have to merge by gravitational radiation, I think and the answer to that is, it's very likely that they could get tidally locked. And then if you ask the question, if, it, if it's tidally locked, what kind of angular momentum is in the, in the star compared to um, spin equals to one, if you form this into a black hole, how, how close will this be? If it's tidally locked, how, how close this will be? To, is it a lot of angular momentum? The answer is yes. So. Um, Naively, you would say that uh, tides are very, very strong functions of the separation. But so you, you could imagine that even if stars are born uh, with little angular momentum, just this process will make at least the second star in many situations become tidally locked and uh, have high sp the, the, the corresponding black hole have a high spin. What, are, what should I think of the period being for this uh, phase? These, like, uh, is that like days or uh, hours? I think, or... I think it's less than days. I forget. Let's see if, if this guy. Uh, but the, the separation is uh, uh, maybe, you know, it's uh, tens of, so we can try to work it out. Right? <laughs> tens of uh, solar radii. Uh, okay. So solar radii and, and tens, tens of solar masses. And tens of solar masses. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay, David can tell us. Uh, this is this is physics one, so David yes. can tell us. <laughs> okay, so what's the situation with the spins? Uh, yeah, let, before I go to this plot, um, okay, I'm running super out of time. So be, before I go into this plot, um, let me say that uh, if you try to ask, uh, in the absence of this tidal locking, let's say, what is the expectation for the spin of uh, of the core of these very heavy stars. Many people believe that it will not be sp spinning very heavily because as it, ex as it takes, as the envelope, uh, as it loses mass at the end of the very, uh, of, uh, of 
of its life, you know, it will just uh, it will be connected to the core of this envelope and it will just stop the rotation. And so one one up one naive expectation is that perhaps the the very massive stars, the black holes do not spin in the absence of some tidal locking or something like that, would not uh, spin very fast. Counter argument to that is that the measurements of the spins of the black hole in X-ray binaries locally, people claim that they are highly spinning, even maximally spinning. And this, it can, by, by, if you just calculate how much accretion there could possibly be in the lifetime of the, of the, of the, of the star, it wouldn't be enough to gain this uh, spin, the black hole to gain spin by accretion. So <coughs> naively, somehow those stars were born spinning. I don't know, that's kind of a puzzle uh, because uh, to jump a little bit uh, ahead, the LIGO sources don't seem to be spinning. So why they are different from the local ones, as this, is that measurement believable? All of this you can see. Um, okay, but what, how, how does it, um, how does it, um, uh, how does the spin uh, measurements of LIGO look, look like? So let me just show you some very simplistic histogram type of thing. Then I can show you some results from like, some proper analysis, but just so that you can see by eye. The first question that you might want to ask is, is it possible that the spins is just zero? So this is all, this is, uh, that all the all the um, uh, are basically not spinning. All the black holes are basically not spinning. And whenever I see some spin, it's just consistent with the measurement error in each case. So um, and so this is just a histogram of the spin measured for each event divided in the in 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 sigmas of the width of the measurement of that particular event. Uh, if if uh, all the events had uh, had um, zero spin, they should lie on some curve that would look like this, just the cumulative, this is a cumulative, the cumulative distribution of a Gaussian of unit, uh, divided by the variance, so uh, this would be, so you might expect- Why does it go up to 30? Yeah. Why does that go up to Exactly, 30? so you can, that's the point, you can, if you try to get them to, if you try to fit the thing, it will, I you can only make it to 20 without predicting too many negative ones. I see. Right? So here it looks like, the first thing to note is that this does not seem uh, consistent with everybody's not spinning. So it's, sorry, positive is oriented with the with the angular momentum. momentum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it does not seem that it's possible that all of them are not spinning and it's just a, a measurement error. And if anything, there is an excess of positive spin versus negative spin. There's no real evidence in this plot, at least, that there's anybody that's highly spinning negative anti-aligned with the angular <coughs> momentum, um, you know, that you wouldn't expect just from how many you have on the, the error bars of each of the measurements, okay? Um, so um, you have to be a little bit careful about those, uh, that statement because um, about the, so now once you believe that th th there is, everybody not spinning is not a, a good answer, then you can ask the question, if there is some spin to explain this, the fact that I don't see anything on the negative side, is this a reflection of the selection effect that I can see a little bit further, perhaps the positive spins that I can see the negative spins, or is it, um, or is it just that there are no negative spins, ne negatively aligned spins uh, in nature? Okay, this is what this plot is trying to uh, show. Uh, by um, by weighting each of the of the events by how far away you could see it relative to the non-spinning case. So these guys count by less than one because they, you can see them further, and this one counts to more than one because they can see it. You can see it just more nearby. But the bottom line is that this axis here is not. Uh, these are not spins. When you look at the actual magnitude of these spins, they are still quite small. So it's not like they are maximally spinning. They are the chi, the chi effective that can go between minus one and one, like the A, it's a small number. So this selection effect is a small effect. It's not a big deal. So um, there is, of course, uh, some selection effect, but it's not able to account for this 10 versus zero. In, in the two so, um, but 
The other thing that you can also notice is that there are several events where you can measure their spin with you know, many sigmas of zero, but they are still small, right? It's a small spin, it's not close to maximum <coughs> spin. So this argues against this tidal locking and this maximum spin uh, equal to one for one of the black holes. That's just uh, too much. This cannot, it's, it's too little spin. So, um, but I mean, you are doing a vector sum You've done a vector sum, and then you're projecting onto the angular momentum. So yeah, so, um, so I, I I'm not disagreeing. It's just it's a little subtle how that connects to maximally spinning in terms of the black hole. Yeah, so um, there are two things going on. One is that if uh, if uh, this is just uh, in the case that we are talking about uh, spin coming from size, which is aligned with the angular momentum, which is exactly what this is measuring. So there wouldn't be, so I wouldn't, this doesn't argue about maximally spin perpendicular to the angular momentum, which will lead to big precession. So we can discuss that. I don't think I have time, but there's no big evidence, although there's some mild evidence in some of the examples of a little bit of precession, but there's no big evidence for a lot of precession due to the misalignment between the total and, and orbital angular momentum, this will make the system precess. There's not so, that much evidence for that. So um, as a population as a whole, it's not uh, maximally spinning in some other. Um, so, um, okay, so this is the results of the, of the let, let me just, uh, let me just, uh, so bottom line, so th these are results from some more Bayesian blah, blah, okay, so it's supposed to be correct, but at the end of the day is, uh, um, you know, whatever I try to tell, to tell you in terms of these histograms, uh, this uh, is what, uh, what those, that thing uh, shows, um, and, but it's not completely independent because at the current time, both when I, us or LIGO is fitting these uh, population models, they are, we are inventing a little bit the forms of these populations in order to, you know, how, how this, uh, the dependence on, on, the, uh, on, on spin and mass and so on in some toy models. And we're putting Gaussians here, Gaussians there, and things still depend, of course, on those parameters, those parametric forms that you're assuming. So um, if you, if you have the physical picture in which it's reasonable to expect a lot of them not to be spinning at all, and perhaps some of them having spin positive, and perhaps you want to test whether some of them have negative spin, and you put a model that tries to accommodate for these three options, then you discover whatever I told you in words. If you put some other form of the thing, you may discover something else. But I think you can see by eye where the results that we are quoting are coming from. Um, so in the five, let me take five minutes to say, um, so I, I tried to give you some basic uh, of the astrophysics of the LIGO thing, what's going on, but for the most part, what we have been doing is going back to the LIGO data, searching for events ourselves, doing all of the parts of, uh, of uh, the LIGO pipeline, except for computing the waveforms, which we are using the same ones that they're using, all the steps <coughs> related to uh, searching and also estimating parameters, we are doing them ourselves and in different ways. And our claim is that in many of these ways, much better than that. <laughs> and that we are much more sensitive, meaning like a factor of two in volume or something like that. So we're not claiming like some little tweak, but we're claiming some big difference. Have they already adopted your so, methods? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now in, in reality, there is some LIGO team there is some people who were kicked out of life or not left life out <laughs> of uh, frustration. And then there's us, the frustration people have adopted many more and they have something that is very, the other ones, they usually run the codes of the uh, frustrated people and they take a long time to, they have a lot of committees to change things. And so LIGO, some of the things they have not adopted, but this other group has it up. And, and what's the data situation? Is the data all available? All of the data available? Or only no, the, the, the data, yeah, current data all available, but it, because there's been enough time lag. But if not, it's like a year or something like that before 
Well, well, the outside people can take a look. And they released the time stream and all the, the housekeeping data? Not the housekeeping data. And in fact, they gave us a little bit of the housekeeping data uh, because that's being that can be used to that's how you you, you make better the low frequency part. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so they've given us that with the understanding that if we manage to somehow clean differently better and show that you can improve on, on one of the events they give up, maybe they will give all of it to everybody. But, uh, so that's public for everybody as well, not just to us. Uh, but um, so, okay. Um, so um, in, in, in the last few years, uh, in the last year after the O3 events, we've been uh, improving this part of the parameter estimation by a lot. And you would think, I don't care, you just get the parameters, it doesn't matter. But um, so making it, making it a more robust and factors of more than a thousand or faster than the standard way. And the reason why we're doing this, and I think we're almost there, and half of the thing is in some papers already, is that we want to be able to run parameter estimation on all the LIGO events and all of the background that you create by doing the time slides so that we have our current searches do not include precession or higher modes or anything like that because that, those banks are just too complicated but we want to just include all of those by running you know, on all the triggers and all of the background that we are generating to do the, um, the estimation of the false alarm rate through parameter estimation to get the Bayesian evidence and the whole thing. And I think we are there, like, almost. So, okay, so I'm super excited about this, but uh, let me not, uh, we are not, uh, I, I had some plots here, but let's. Uh, uh, what are you super excited about? You will have better measurements? I think we can, find, so uh, at the current, yeah, at the current time, processing systems, we are not, we are not being searched for. So. We, we, once you have a, an event, you try to see if you see any precession. But once the precession is very big, you lose it completely from the search itself. It's not into your list because the and phase they should exist different. processing systems. Or do we know? I don't know. So we could find if they exist, we would find uh, like they, they could be at least. Uh, so you will find new things, perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. Okay. That's the reason. Yeah. That's the reason. And the same with uh, um, for these heavy systems. <laughs> They emit. They don't emit all of their power in the quadrupole moment. They emit uh, also uh, higher uh, L equals to three and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that brings a lot of information. But we are not looking for events. It's, that's not part of the search, neither us or LIGO. But in this way, we can. Uh, we think we can uh, do that uh, completely. Anyway, and you know, instead of taking days or whatever supercomputer, we are talking about. Uh, like 10 seconds for the whole parameter thing, the whole thing. So um, anyway, here are some information about that. Um, but um, let me let me fi finish with this uh, plot. So um, um, in the search itself, our claim is that uh, we are much more sensitive to than uh, than than they are. For the most part, because the data is not Gaussian, and so even though we are all using match filter technique, which is uh, guaranteed to be the best thing you can, uh, if you can do, if the data is just Gaussian noise, the, the data is definitely not Gaussian noise, and so how you deal with that has huge implications. So this is just a plot. So what we typically do is run a match filter in the two detectors, Hanford and Livingston, um, and you get a trigger. You need to have a trigger when there is something. Uh, uh, there should be a trigger in both detectors. This is the signal to noise ratio squared of triggers in Hanford and Livingston, OK? And let's just look at the blue points. These are LIGO events from um, O2, OK? Um, so and let's just focus on these guys and so one of them. So it was a well-detected uh, event for LIGO, but they claimed a false alarm rate of one in five years, okay? This uh, black thing, the dots, these are the histogram of all our background events after <coughs> more like 6,000, 6, you know, we do time slides and so we generate fake data corresponding to many more years of uh, 
of uh, observation. And you can see there's nobody coming near this guy in no way, play, shape, or form. So for us, the, the, the false alarm rate is less than one in this amount of 6,000 years, just because we didn't generate enough background to know better, okay? But there's just nothing nearby. And, um, and so this, uh, this difference in the background in the two searches boils down to two things. First of all, the significance of the things that LIGO claims is very different and things that are closer to the boundary have, you know, we can say with different, much better one way or another, whether it's real or not. And then we have things closer to the boundary uh, that uh, they would claim that for them, they are not significant, but for us, they are significant, okay? And so that's why we have roughly double the number. But they do see it too. It's in a humongous list somewhere. You will find, the, if you go look at the GPS time, you will find it in the list. Some, you know, sometimes it might be so low in the list that they don't even report this list. But for many of them, yes, it will be in the list among a lot of things. But most of these other things we have thrown out of our search because of various things much before uh, they got into this list. Our list is... So it is in their list, but only you can select it out yes, of their list. Yes, that's your yeah, plan. And by now, these other people... Uh, yeah, although you don't have a lot of time, you should at least say something about how exactly, you do that. Exactly. <laughs> Give us some... Machine more. learning! <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> no, so what what, what, what no was your trick? Yeah, two tricks. <laughs> Two tricks. No, seriously. Give yeah, yeah, two Otherwise, tricks. Otherwise, what do we learn from you? <laughs> no, I, yeah. I do nothing, Andre, nothing. You, I don't but I want, I came here to learn from you. Sorry. Teach me something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, two. Uh, so it's yes, not Max. Take mine. Yeah. So, uh, uh, okay, there are two reasons. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, we recorded. <laughs> Maybe I can put some balls like this with some... No, no Max stuff. No Max stuff. That's, uh, that's not the thing. Uh, okay, so as I was saying, if the uh, all of us are doing match filtering, which is the thing that is the best, if it's Gaussian noise, okay? Uh, and these are power spectrum of the noise of these detectors and the match filter is you just run this thing over the data you see when there is something else. but the data is not um is not uh, gaussian in two ways one every so often there are bad stuff going on okay like you can see this uh, frequency versus time these are not gravitational waves these are they are called glitches okay so we are super um super um um, conservative anytime. So we have lots of, we've developed by trial and error on, the, you know, a percent of the data with the philosophy that anything that is bright, they should have already detected. So we just want to clean the whole thing as much as possible. So anything that doesn't look like a gravitational wave in which there's power in some frequency and not power in some other frequency, test of this nature, we just throw the data out. We, from the very beginning, Looking at, at the spectrograms like this, we make holes in the data much more aggressively than they did. Okay, that's one part. And uh, the other part is that this, um, and then I will show you the effect of these two things. Uh, the, the, the other part is that this noise that I'm showing you is changing with time all the time in the detector. So it's on the times of, you know, of, few seconds is, you know, changing by tens of percent, right? The, 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 um, uh, the, um, these triggers that we are looking at in the Gaussian noise, they are super high, uh, unlikely tails. If you are mis, mis, uh, mis, uh, characterizing the width of that Gaussian, because the, the VSD is changing like that, you just wait for the time in which you, uh, you know, have it wrong by 30%, and then you will create much easier all of these high tail things, right? And so if you don't, cannot follow the, the, the variation of the PSD on very short time scale, you will have a big tail of events, fake events. So we measure this, uh, this is some sort of non-Gaussianity 
of the signal similar to what these uh, cosmologists would call tau and l, and there would be some sort of quadratic estimator to get the thing. And we implemented the version of this, which you know it's just measuring the variance locally, very fast and so. Um, but so we track on the. So this is the power spectrum of the changes in time of the amplitude of the PSD, and so you can see like a huge one over f type noise in this in this thing that uh, in the amplitude of this noise which makes a big difference into the rate of frequency so here are plots of um, is the Livingston detector better I think depends for uh, sometimes it depends whether you're talking about uh, whether you're talking about glitches or you're talking about this thing and times of the year so they are very different they are different yes so this is just a um, uh, final plot there. This is the rate at which you see triggers in Hertz when you do this search, okay? These are for different masses. So let's look at any of these plots. So if it was a Gaussian uh, random field, this should be, if it was Gaussian noise, this should be a line similar to the green uh, power law like that, a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom or something. So this is what you actually see if you don't do anything, right? Okay, and these are different masses. It depends on the masses what you see, but you can see that the, the rate of triggers is many orders of magnitude above what you would expect for just Gaussian noise. So if you can clean this by, there's a lot of room for improvement now. If we can. And so the green line is what we are getting after we do this, these two different effects. The, the vetoing of parts that we think are bad and uh, change the, this PSD drift, the change. Uh, these are the, the two things that are going on. And these different curves are you turn one of those corrections on and the other one on and to see which one is more important. It depends on the mass, which one it is. But I think what of the mass of the event. But I think what you what you can take away is that if you don't do anything, you're like this. We have managed to get it something like this. Then here we still see some glitches, so we're not perfect anyway. But you can see how you can clean many orders of magnitude in the rate. And these are the, the significance at which you see something is the probability that there's, by coincidence, a trigger in one and in the other detector. So it's the square of this rate of triggers in each job. Multi, the rate of Livingston times the rate of Hanford. Okay? That are the chances that you're going to get something by chance. And if you can suppress things by these many orders of magnitude, um, that's why we're, there's a lot of difference. It's not that they're not doing anything, by the way. So but they, if there's a distribution of masses, shouldn't, doesn't this mean you would find way more sources? Well, you, you, no, what will happen is that you will find way more, but you will also find them in the time slides that in the, in the noise. So you would have a lot of background. This is, this, you, you, you will generate a huge background by chance, right? Yeah. You would know yeah. how much it is. So their thresholds have to be high. Right? Yeah. You can lower your thresholds. Exactly. Where are your new... Yeah, we have twice as many. You do have twice as yeah, many twice. already. Yeah. Have you I released mean, those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we don't have the ones for O3B yet, but for... I see. Yeah, yeah there's twice as many. I see. And by now, I mean, in the LIGO paper, sometimes they quote them. The other guys, of course, they quote them. They also have them. Uh, so yeah, the, it's not twice; it's seventy percent. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. So fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Let's thank the table. <laughs> Are there more questions from not Andre or David or me? Yeah, yes. I mean, obviously not top of the main top of your talk, but these glitches. I mean, in, in the past, I've looked at their glitch pages and things, and there are various categories. But they have things that looked by eye quite structured. Yes. They have repeated yes. cases of this, and they don't have any explanation for at least some cases. In some you, cases. Yeah, in some cases. So have you spent some time um, looking at, at these in more detail and really? Yes. Yeah, so okay. Um, so I think there are the ones that my my little figure there of the glitches are very the very bright ones. And those have been classified by people like the gravity spy. These are not, um, first of all, they are trivial to see there's something bad going on. And so we would put a hole there, that is not, and it will not serve. If somebody reports an event by one of these yellow things, nobody will believe yeah. it. So there's no point, so that you throw. 
But in reality, the um, the, um, um, the the important ones are ones that are much less bright than that, um, because there are many more of them, and then you are sometimes not sure one way or the other. And we've spent some time. There are some regularities of them. They're perhaps different from the ones that uh, you can see by eye like that. Uh, that sometimes they even know what they are from, some scattered light or whatever. Um, we haven't been able to use this to, um, but we've spent quite a bit of time to, to improve our sensitivity to like, for example, you could imagine having some templates that catch glitches. If they were all the same, we would have some glitch template. We have some search like this and, I don't know, a little bit, but then you are not so sure. Nah. Yeah, we haven't, it, it hasn't paid up, but I always want to do it. So I always return to this. Uh, and we also know that, for example, uh, made in, in some parts of our banks, we call them the glitch magnets. There's a lot of glitches. So if you look in, there's like some of these glitches really, some waveforms in particularly of the, of the, um, uh, GWs are very similar to some of these glitches. So this is not a question. What are glitches? In the detector? No, in What's reality. It? Yeah, what are they actually? What the things What are... is it? You, whatever. It's oh, yeah. your yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. So for example, sometimes it's to do with that. Um, sometimes it's to do, I think one of the mirrors has some impurity or, or uh, uh, yeah, one of the mirrors I think has what, some impurity somewhere. And if the beam happens to um, happens to go to it, then there's a bunch of scattered light that goes back and creates some signal. <coughs> so this nature, this kind of stuff. Some of them they don't know, but some of them they do. Yeah, some of them they know. Yeah, you know, this, if you see here, there's like all these lines like that. Uh, I mean, if you, afterwards you can take a look. Uh, and they repeat, some of them they know, some of them they know. And in fact, the, um, a lot of the LIGO data, they would come with a flag that would say, I mean, these guys, I'm sure it's going to, turn, if you look at their flag, it will, they will already tell you. Do we have any other questions? Sorry. So, I remember you guys did some events, we should take some lens events. So what happened to the also is still there? Oh, the event is there, the event is there. So yeah, the problem, this is a bad event because unfortunately, so yeah, we, we went to look for some, uh, See if there was a lensing event. So what you would have looked for, you would look for same parameters, uh, and then it turns out that this is uh, diff in addition to um, is different from like regular is lensing of some wave. So you can of the of the images, the ones that are maximum of the time delay. You know the images in the lensing are maximum or subtle points or minimum of the time delay. The subtle points of the time delay get a, a get a phase shift of pi. Mm -hmm. um, so in the case here, you have the actual waveform. It's not just the parameters they need to match, but they need to match with, it could match with a pi, not with a random phase. Um, and so- Sorry, the, the, what you see is you see two different waveforms at different times, times with the delay because it's two images. Time delay, exactly, so strong exactly. Plus so. some polarization. And in one form. case, yeah, there could be, and the, the location of the sky needs to agree and all of this stuff. And so, yeah, we went to do this search and uh, we found some candidate like that. And then we figured out this phase thing and we said, and usually people thought it was not measurable, but it turns out that the phase, if you fit them together, the phase difference is actually measurable. So we decided to do it, we went and then it had this pi, I don't know. So you start multiplying these probabilities and it's like a rare, it's, I don't remember now, but it's many sigmas unlikely. But also that, that, that it's uh, just a coincidence because the, 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 the event, the parameters were too close, the location of the sky were too close, and there was this part, I don't know. So um, on the other hand, if you estimate the lensing, it's also very unlikely. So I don't yeah, know. What fraction so you, yeah, you're, you're talking like you have a very low prior that was raised by data. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was right. like this. Well, uh, it's kind of was like. This. But 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 what is well, it? But then, oh, but, but by the way, then uh, then the, but also people have estimated the time delays that you would expect, and so this was kind of long time delay, so there was more options of coincidence. But this was taken into account. But in any case, 
if there was something doing the lensing with these big time delays, it should have been a group or something. Then we went, there was some sort of group there. I don't know. I don't know. But the chances of the lensing thing doesn't make sense. So I don't know. But there's not going to be any. Okay. There's only one. one yeah. yeah. Unless, uh, I think the only way that this could, uh, this could uh, uh, fix itself uh, is if somehow we were to find this lensing system there and some the lensing of the galaxy where this guy is supposed to be and there's I mean, a time delay from the magnification ratio so you do know something yeah you know the magnification exactly and you if know, you know the time delay you yeah know you know the, the time delay so this is possible but there is no survey in that area you know you know we we need special observations but also, you have very poor sky localization at the moment, right? But so, yeah, it was very poor, but this particular guy was not as poor because there was Virgo and, and also once you fit it, I think there were more than, I forget now, because there were more than uh, uh, two, two uh, images. Oh, then I say something else. Um, and, um, and so then with two of them, you get a better localization. The other one went there. And then we did something else, which was we said, okay, let's if we are now looking from a particular point of the sky, we could go deeper into our search uh, because we have to pay this Lucas square effect for everybody for this particular occasion. We could, and for these particular parameters, we could go deeper, mm -hmm. see if there is another, and there was something. Yeah, well, you should do that for everyone, yeah. right? For every source, you should look deeper for yeah. opposite okay. parity. Yeah, okay. In principle, yes. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> <note. Yes. laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you.